What do you know? They were right. Mm. If I had my little way. one and all and welcome back to Tom's Hit Parade coming at you today with the July edition of Backtracks my monthly roundup of notable album anniversaries divisible by five with at least one spotlight album review so let's just get started and see which albums are celebrating anniversaries for the month of July 2020 shall we 65 years ago this month Lena Horne released her album It's Love this was her first proper studio album as previous releases were collections of 78 rpm singles Produced, arranged, and conducted by Lenny Hayden, this album featured her renditions of Cole Porter's You Do Something to Me, the Arlen Gershwin classic Fun to Be Fooled, and the Yip Harburg and Arthur Schwartz tune Then I'll Be Tired of You. And as a trivia note, Horn and Hayden were in fact married. It was the second marriage for both and one of the few high-profile interracial marriages of the time. July of 1955 also saw the release of Eddie Fisher Sings Academy Award-winning songs. Backed by Axel Stordahl's orchestra, Fisher managed to stuff onto a single LP all 21 songs that had up to that point won the Oscar for Best Original Song, although they were obviously shortened versions. Tracks included Secret Love, featured in the film Calamity Jane, The Way You Look Tonight, from Swing Time, When You Wish Upon a Star, heard in the Disney classic Pinocchio, Swinging on a Star, from Going My Way, and of course, Over the Rainbow, from the legendary movie The Wizard of Oz. In July of 1960, Ricky Nelson released his fifth album, More Songs by Ricky. This release marked a change from the rockabilly and upbeat pop Nelson had become popular for thus far to a softer pop style. Unfortunately, it also marked the start of a decline in his popularity. Whereas previous albums and singles ranked higher, this album only reached number 18 on the Billboard chart, and his single, I'm Not Afraid, charted outside the top 20. The album also included Nelson's renditions of pop songs such as Baby Won't You Please Come Home, I'd Climb the Highest Mountain, and the Sammy Kahn Jewel Stein standard, Time After Time. Also celebrating its 60th anniversary this month is the Miles Davis album Sketches of Spain. Accompanied by arranger Gil Evans, Davis was inspired to record this album after attending a flamenco dance performance with his wife. Consisting mostly of Concierto de Aranjuez, a 16-minute guitar piece by Joaquin Rodrigo, the album won Davis the 1961 Grammy for Best Original Jazz Composition and is included in Rolling Stone's list of the 500 greatest albums of all time. And this one holds a special place in my heart uh, because I actually inherited this CD from my sister Kim. So, as I'm not the hugest Miles Davis fan, but uh, I'm beginning to really appreciate his work and this is one of his standout albums. 55 years ago this month saw the release of Doris Day's Sentimental Journey. Her last album for Columbia Records, it includes her renditions of four Matt Gordon and Harry Warren compositions, including At Last, which was made famous by Etta James five years earlier, and Serenade in Blue, as well as the Duke Ellington classic I'm Beginning to See the Light, Johnny Mercer's I Remember You, and a re-recorded version of the title track, the original version of which was her first number one hit in 1945. Although Day recorded songs in 1967 for a follow-up album, it wouldn't be released until 1994, making this her last studio album for nearly 30 years. Also released in July of 1965 was the Moody Blues debut album The Magnificent Moody's. Consisting of a more R&B sound as opposed to the rock style for which they'd become famous, the album reached number 5 on the UK Albums Chart. The single, Go Now, after which the album was retitled for its U.S. release, was a number one hit in the U.K., reached number two in Canada, and hit the top ten on the U.S. chart. Two other singles, I Don't Want to Go On Without You and From the Bottom of My Heart, were top 40 U.K. hits, although they only appeared on the U.S. version of the album, which never charted on the Billboard 200. Did you follow all that? Half a century ago this month, Traffic released their fourth album, John Barleycorn Must Die. Originally intended by Steve Winwood to be a solo album, Two years after Traffic's initial breakup and following the short-lived supergroup Blind Faith, it eventually became Traffic's reunion album when Chris Wood and Jim Capaldi rejoined Winwood. It ended up being their highest charting album in the U.S., reaching number 5 on the Billboard 200 and being certified gold. It peaked at number 11 on the U.K. album chart. Single Empty Pages became a modest hit, reaching number 74 on the Billboard Hot 100 during its eight-week chart run. July of 1970 also saw the release of The James Gang Rides Again. This sophomore album from the Joe Walsh-led band The James Gang peaked at number 20 on the Billboard 200 and number 13 on the Canadian album chart, the group's highest positions on both charts. It remained on the U.S. chart for over a year and went gold. 
Single Funk No. 49 charted on the Billboard Hot 100 and has since been used in numerous films such as Can't Hardly Wait, Lords of Dogtown, and Detroit Rock City, TV shows including Supernatural, The Sopranos, and Cold Case, and in the video game franchises Rock Band and Grand Theft Auto. In July of 1975, Glenn Campbell released his 30th album, Rhinestone Cowboy. It topped the Billboard Country Albums chart and climbed to number 17 on the Billboard 200. It was a top 10 album in Canada, peaking at number 7. The title track went top 10 in 10 countries, including number 1 on both the country singles charts and primary singles charts in both Canada and the US. And it was the first single in 14 years to top both the Billboard Hot 100 and the Billboard Country chart on the same week. It was, of course, one of Campbell's signature songs, and won the ACM Award for Single of the Year, the CMA Award for Song of the Year, and earned Grammy nominations for Best Pop Vocal Performance and Record of the Year. Subsequent single, Country Boy, You Got Your Feet in L.A., reached number three on the Billboard Country chart. Also released 45 years ago this month was Casey and the Sunshine Band's self-titled sophomore album. Their breakthrough hit, it reached the top of the Billboard R&B Albums chart and number four on the Billboard 200. It was also a top five album in Canada, where it went platinum, and reached number seven in Australia. The singles Get Down Tonight and That's the Way I Like It were number one hits on the Canadian singles chart, the Billboard R&B chart, and the Billboard Hot 100. That's the Way I Like It also reached number one in the Netherlands and number five in Australia. Two and a half years after the album's release in early 1978, its track Boogie Shoes was a top 40 chart hit after its inclusion on the soundtrack to the movie Saturday Night Fever. Four decades ago this month, Zap released their self-titled debut album. It spent two weeks at number one on the Billboard R&B Albums chart and reached number 19 on the Billboard 200, and before the end of the year, it achieved gold certification by the RIAA. George Clinton and Bootsy Collins of the Parliament Funkadelic Collective played a part in Zap's success, with Clinton convincing Zap frontman Roger Troutman to submit their demo tape to Warner Brothers, and Collins contributing guitar work and production to this album. The single, More Bounce to the Ounce, hit number two on the Billboard R&B singles chart and number 86 on the Billboard Hot 100, and has since been sampled numerous times by West Coast hip-hop artists, helping to give rise to the G-Funk subgenre of hip-hop. July of 1980 also saw the release of Voices, the ninth album by Daryl Hall and John Oates. During its 100-week run on the Billboard 200, longer than any other Hall & Oates album, it reached a peak position of number 17, which happened 10 months after its chart debut. Within a year and a half, the album had achieved platinum certification. Two of the album's singles were top 10 hits. Kiss on My List topped the chart in January of 1981, and You Make My Dreams climbed to number 5 three months later. Their cover of the Righteous Brothers' You've Lost That Love and Feelin' was a top 20 hit, and in a paying it forward sort of way, the album track Every Time You Go Away, written by Daryl Hall, would become a number one hit for Paul Young in 1985. Happy 35th anniversary this month to the self-titled eighth album by Heart. Their first for the Capitol label, it also became their only album to top the Billboard 200, ultimately spending 92 weeks on the chart and going five times platinum. The album peaked at number three in Canada and number 19 in the UK. The album spawned no fewer than four Billboard Hot 100 top 10 singles. What About Love and Nothing At All hit number 10, Never reached number four, and These Dreams topped the Hot 100. These Dreams was a top 10 hit in Canada and the UK, with Never also reaching the top 10 in the UK, and What About Love also going top 10 in Canada. Also released in July of 1985 was Aretha Franklin's 30th album, Who's Zoomin' Who. It was her first and only album to achieve platinum certification in the U.S., and was her highest charting album since 1972, reaching number 13 on the Billboard 200 and number 3 on the Billboard R&B Albums chart. It was a top 10 album in New Zealand and Sweden, and a top 20 album in Canada and Australia. The singles, Freeway of Love and the title track, hit number 1 and number 2, R-E-S-P-E-C Tivoli, on the Billboard R&B singles chart, were number one hits on the Billboard Dance Chart, and reached the top ten on the Billboard Hot 100. Sisters Are Doing It For Themselves, featuring Eurythmics, went top 20 on the Hot 100 and top ten on the Dance Chart. Freeway of Love also charted in the top five in Australia, New Zealand, and Canada, and Sisters was a top ten hit in the UK and New Zealand. By coincidence, Aretha's final album, Aretha Sings the Great Diva Classics, reached the same peak positions on the Billboard 200 and the Billboard R&B Albums Chart in 2014. In July of 1990, Poison released their third album, Flesh and Blood. It reached the number two position on the Australian Albums Chart and the Billboard 200. It was also a top five album in Canada, New Zealand, and the UK. Within eight months, it had gone triple platinum in the US, and it's also certified multi-platinum in Canada and platinum in Australia. Lead-off single, Unskinny Bop, peaked at number three on the New Zealand and Canadian singles charts and on the Billboard Hot 100. 
follow-up single, Something to Believe in, also hit number three in Canada and reached number four in the U.S. Subsequent singles, Ride the Wind and Life Goes On, were top 40 hits on the Billboard Hot 100. 30 years ago this month also saw the release of Two Live Crew's fourth album, Band in the USA. It peaked at number 21 on the Billboard 200 and number 10 on the Billboard Hip Hop Albums chart and achieved gold certification by the RIAA. The title track, the album's first single, reached the top 20 of the Billboard Hot 100 and number 1 on the Billboard Rap Tracks chart, and is a reference to the obscenity charges faced by the group over their previous album, As Nasty As They Want to Be, which was declared obscene and outlawed in Broward County, Florida, a decision that was later overturned on appeal, and led to the music industry's adoption of the Parental Advisory Warning Label, which is still in use today. In fact, Band in the USA was probably not coincidentally, the first album on which the label ever appeared. A quarter of a century ago this month saw the major label release of the self-titled debut album by the Presidents of the United States of America. The indie version was released four months earlier. It peaked at number six on the Billboard 200, number five in Canada, and number three in Australia and New Zealand. It's been certified triple platinum in the US and four times platinum in Canada and Australia. Four singles were released from the album, Kitty, Lump, Peaches, and Dune Buggy all of which reached the top 20 of the Billboard Alternative Songs chart. Lump hit number one and Peaches hit number eight. Peaches also charted in the top 40 of the Billboard Hot 100. Lump and Peaches both hit the top 20 of the Australian and UK singles charts, the top 10 in New Zealand and number one on the Canadian Alternative Songs chart. The band liked Gump, Weird Al Yankovic's parody of Lump, so much that they incorporated his closing lyric into their concert performances of the song until they disbanded in 2015. And that's all I have to say about that. Also released in July of 1995 was Shaggy's third album, Boombastic. It topped the Billboard Reggae Albums chart and peaked at number 34 on the Billboard 200 and was certified platinum in the US. It climbed to number 11 in Australia and number 10 in New Zealand. Its first two singles, In the Summertime and Boombastic, both reached number three on the Billboard Hot 100, with the title track hitting number one in Australia, New Zealand, and the UK. Subsequent single, Why You Treat Me So Bad, reached the top 20 in the UK and New Zealand. In the Summertime was a cover of the Mungo Jerry single from 1970, and Boombastic was used in a Levi's ad in 1995, and most recently, a Chase Bank ad in 2016. You know, the one with the baby pig walking down the street? I love that ad. July of 2000 saw the release of Ronan, the solo debut album by Boyzone vocalist Ronan Keating. It was a number one album in the UK, Norway, and Denmark, a number two album in New Zealand, Germany, and Keating's native Ireland, and a top ten album in six other countries. Its first two singles, When You Say Nothing At All and Life Is A Roller Coaster, topped both the UK and Irish singles charts, hit the top five in Sweden and New Zealand, and the top ten in Australia. Later singles, The Way You Make Me Feel, not a cover of the Michael Jackson single, and Lovin' Each Day, made the top 10 of the UK, Irish, and New Zealand singles charts. When You Say Nothing At All was featured in the romantic comedy film Notting Hill. Also released 20 years ago this month was Jill Scott's debut album, Who Is Jill Scott? Words and Sounds, Volume 1. It peaked at number 2 on the Billboard R&B Albums chart and number 17 on the Billboard 200. It was also a top 10 album on the UK R&B Albums chart. Lead-off single, Gettin' In The Way, hit number three on the Billboard R&B singles chart and was a top 40 single in the UK. Subsequent singles, A Long Walk and The Way, charted on the Billboard Hot 100, with A Long Walk landing in the R&B top 10 and The Way reaching the R&B top 20. The album won the Soul Train Music Award for Best Female R&B Album and was nominated for a Grammy for Best R&B Album, while Jill herself earned a Grammy nomination for Best New Artist. Additionally, three singles were nominated for Best Female R&B Vocal Performance in three consecutive Grammy years. Happy 15th anniversary this month to Mr. A to Z, Jason Mraz's sophomore album. Although it charted much higher on the Billboard 200 than his debut, number five in contrast to Waiting for My Rocket to Come's number 55 peak, this album achieved only gold certification by the RIAA, whereas his debut went platinum. The first single, Wordplay, reached number 16 on the Billboard Adult Top 40 chart and also charted on the Billboard Hot 100. Follow-up single, Geek in the Pink, also reached the Adult Top 40 chart and was a top 10 single in Hungary. The album features guest vocals by Rachel Yamagata on the track Did You Get My Message, drums by Amir Questlove Thompson on Geek in the Pink, and guitar by Latin jazz artist Raul Midon on two tracks. July of 2005 also saw the release of the All-American Rejects sophomore album, Move Along. It spent 84 weeks in the top half of the Billboard 200, reaching a peak position of number 6. It reached number 3 on the Canadian Albums chart. 
Within a year, it had gone platinum in the US, and by March of 2007 had achieved platinum certification in Canada. All three singles, Dirty Little Secret, It Ends Tonight, and the title track, were top 15 hits on the Billboard Hot 100, with the former two peaking in the top 10. Dirty Little Secret peaked in the top 20 in the UK, It Ends Tonight reached number 39 in both Canada and New Zealand, and Move Along, the single, went top 10 in Canada. In July of 2010, Rick Ross released his fourth album, Teflon Dawn. It peaked at number 2 on the Billboard 200 and Billboard Hip Hop Albums chart, and it reached number 17 on the Canadian Albums chart. First single, Super High, featuring Neo, reached the top 20 of the Billboard R&B and Rap Singles charts. BMF, Blowin' Money Fast, hit the top 10 of both charts. Aston Martin Music topped the Rap Singles chart and went top 40 on the Billboard Hot 100. Rolling Stone and Pitchfork placed the album on their lists of the best albums of 2010. The album also features contributions from Jay-Z, Kanye West, Erica Badu, and Drake. Also released 10 years ago this month was Kylie Minogue's 11th album, Aphrodite. It topped the album's charts in Scotland, Greece, and in the UK, where it made Kylie the first solo artist to have a number one album in four consecutive decades. It peaked at number two in Spain, Switzerland, and Kylie's native Australia, where it held that peak position for three weeks. It was a top 10 album in 13 other countries and reached number 19 in the US. Lead off single, All the Lovers, was a top 20 hit in Australia and a top five hit in France and the UK. Follow up single, Get Out of My Way, hit the UK top 20. All four singles released from the album topped the U.S. Dance Songs chart. Aphrodite scored Kylie Aria Award nominations for Best Pop Album and Best Female Artist. July of 2015 saw the release of Tame Impala's third album, Currents. Written, performed, recorded, and produced entirely by frontman Kevin Parker, the album reached number one on the Australian Albums chart, number three in the U.K., and number four on the Billboard 200. Lead-off single, Let It Happen, was a top 20 hit in Belgium and reached the top 40 of the Billboard Adult Alternative Songs chart. Subsequent single, The Less I Know The Better, charted in the Australian Top 20, the top 40 of the Billboard Hot Rock Songs chart, and on the Belgian Singles chart. The album won ARIA Awards for Album of the Year and Best Rock Album, and was nominated for a Grammy for Best Alternative Music Album. Pitchfork, Spin, NME, and Mojo ranked Currents in their top five albums of the year, and Q Magazine proclaimed it the year's best album. Also released five years ago this month was Communion, the debut album by Years and Years. It peaked at the top of the UK, Scottish, and Irish album charts, reached number five in Australia, number eight in Canada, and number 47 on the Billboard 200, although it did top the Billboard Dance and Electronic Albums chart. In the UK, it sold more copies in its debut week than the rest of the top five albums combined. An impressive seven singles were spawned from the album. King went number one in the UK and Scotland, and the top five in Ireland and the Netherlands. Shine also topped the Scottish singles chart and peaked at number two in the UK while going top ten in Ireland. Eyes Shut hit the UK and Scottish top 20, and Desire peaked in the top 40 in the UK and the Netherlands. It's Spotlight Album Time. It's Spotlight Album Time. Yes, it is Spotlight Album time once again, and I'm happy to announce that this month I'm finally bringing you another Two Album Spotlight Month. Yes, I've had more One Album Spotlight Months this year than I really, really wanted to have. Uh, I, I'd like to bring you guys as many Spotlight Albums throughout the year as I can. But of course, you know, with 2020 being what it is, it's thrown everybody for a loop, myself included. So, you know, in some respects, I'm kind of glad I've... Uh, lucky that I've been able to keep things going like I have been able to do. So... But anyway, I did have to kind of compromise, though. Uh, I was going to bring you a higher profile Spotlight album this month, but I could only find it new. I couldn't find it used, so it would have cost more, naturally. So I would have only been able to bring you the one Spotlight album. So in the interest of doubling your pleasure, doubling your fun for Spotlight albums this month, I decided to compromise, as I, as I said, and give you two albums, but they're lower, lower profile, you know, less significant albums. But they're still good, in my opinion. They're still worthy additions to my collection, pretty much. But anyway, let's just go ahead and get on with the proceedings here. The first Spotlight album of this month, for July 2020, was released back in July of 1985, so it is 35 years old this month. It is Mask of Smiles, the third album by John Waite. And now John Waite is, uh, in terms of his sound, he's basically kind of like Richard Marks uh, or a, a lower-tier Brian Adams, basically, you know, uh, 80s guitar rock singer songwriter kind of stuff you know so that's basically the sound that you're going to expect from John Waite 
John Waite's big hit, uh, he, I don't know if he could just technically be classified as a one-hit wonder, but his big hit was called Missing You, and that was on the album before this one. Uh, his previous album was No Breaks, and that is the album that had that big, big hit for him. Uh, this album actually reached number 36 on the Billboard 200, so it was, it was a top 40 album, but not a huge album. But it was relatively successful in its own right. Uh, two of the singles on this album, Every Step of the Way hit number 25 on the singles charts, and Welcome to Paradise hit number 85 on the Billboard Hot 100. So a moderately successful album. One of the standouts on this album, this, the unfortunate thing here is that it doesn't have the track listing on the back of the album, so I have to go to the sleeve. Let's go to the sleeve! And it has the uh, track listing here. Uh, yes, it, it opens with Every Step of the Way, that uh, uh, number 25, top 40 hit single. Very good. And uh, it has a song on here called Lust for Life, which is not a cover of the David Bowie song. This is uh, this, These songs are all original, except for uh, he does a rendition of Ain't That Peculiar, which is the, uh, I believe, a Smokey Robinson song. It was a Motown song back in the 60s. And uh, the original Motown version was kind of a mid-tempo kind of thing. But uh, John Waite puts it in a rock arrangement, which, which you know gives it an interesting sound. It actually works very, very well, much better than I thought it would in a rock arrangement, a very upbeat rock arrangement. So that was, that was a standout, in my opinion. And so, yeah, this is a nine-track album, by the way. Uh, five tracks on side A and two, four tracks on side B. And... Uh, Side B was a little misleading when I first listened to it because the first two tracks on Side B are ballads, which of course leads you to think that the entire second half of the album is going to be slow and quiet. But it actually picks up at the end, ends on a high note, with uh, two of the best songs on the album, in my opinion, uh, You're the One and No Breaks, two very, very good songs that close out the album on an upbeat note. So, but yeah, this is a, it's a pretty good album, by the way, i got to say. Um, yeah, and it, it's making me want to check out uh, John Waite's, uh, the rest of John Waite's discography. Uh, so yeah, it's very good. And this one actually came with a poster. There we go. So, you know, a little weird. What can I say? Yeah, he's he's wearing this interesting outfit on the uh, poster. So, but hey, I got a poster for free with a record. Why, you know, why not? I don't have the wall space, which in terms of how that poster looks, I'm kind of glad I don't have the wall space. So anyway. Uh, yeah. The the dubiousness of the poster aside, it's a good album. I mean, I, I have to say, you know, check out John Waite if you're in the mood for some 80s rock, for something along the lines of, as I said, Brian Adams or possibly Richard Marks. Check out John Waite. Okay, this next Spotlight album, and I will have to admit, I have to make a confession here, I kind of fudged things a little bit, uh, just because I was having trouble finding a second Spotlight album that I could afford, and I really wanted to, as I said, I wanted to give you guys two Spotlight albums this month. Uh, I was looking through the newly arrived used records at House of Records a couple weeks ago, and saw this one there, and I thought it looked really interesting, as you'll see by the cover art in a minute. And so I looked at the uh, copyright uh, data on the back of the cover, which I always do, and it was released in 1980, so it is 40 years old this year. Yes, I was unable to, at the record store, I was unable to nail down the month of release. I couldn't confirm the month of release, but uh, since I was kind of in a in a bit of a bind, I was planning on recording backtracks last weekend, but I didn't get it to it until this weekend. You know, I just, I had to find an album, so I decided this was going to work, and I kind of judged it on the mathematics, I guess you, you could say, of the situation. We're in the middle of the year. You can't be more than six months away from the release of the album, right? So... You know, the math was in my favor, I guess. So, hey. And I, I actually ultimately found out that this album was released in February of 1980. So I was off by four months, but hey, what can you do? But as I said, this album was just interesting enough that I decided I had to bring it uh, into my channel, show it to you guys, and uh, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun to listen to. Anyway, the second Spotlight album for the month of July 2020 is by Sue Saad and the Next. It is their self-titled album, and I had never heard of these people before until I saw this album, as I said, in the uh, newly arrived used records at House of Records. And as, as you can see, uh, you see what I mean by the cover art kind of uh, intrigued me a little bit. It, it was interesting, it kind of looked cool, and what I first thought of when I saw the cover art was Blondie. It just kind of had that Blondie aesthetic uh, and also because it was an all-male band except for the uh, lead singer was female, which is ex exactly the configuration of Blondie. And uh, it turns out I was not too far off in terms of the music. The music does f kind of follow the Blondie aesthetic. Uh, very um, post-punk, early new wave 
kind of stuff. Uh, and it's, it's actually very, very fun, good, uh, enjoyable music. And uh, I actually found out when I realized the release month of this year of this album finally in one of my uh, chart books that I have uh, uh, on my bookshelf. It actually reached number 131 on the Billboard 200, so it didn't even crack the top half of the Billboard, Billboard 200. But uh, And Susad and the next uh, eventually went on to record songs for a handful of soundtracks during the 80s. So this was their only uh, major label release uh, album. And But honestly, I think it was pretty darn good in my opinion. Uh, some of the standout tracks are Won't Give Up and I, I, Me, Me. That, that was a fun one. And also It's Gotcha. And those three songs are, as I said, really standouts. And there's another song on here called Prisoner, which was actually the most noteworthy song that came out of this album. It was uh, covered by Sheena Easton in 1981 and by Uriah Heep in 1982. So that song kind of made the rounds on, uh, you know, popular music over the coming few years after this album was put out. So uh, one, of the, one of the songs on this album that I did not care for much at all was Young Girl. It just it just sounded kind of silly. The lyrics sounded kind of silly. It might have been the fact that it was a reggae arrangement that uh, made it sound a little out of place on the album, and also it made it sound like kind of a cheap knockoff of No Doubt, even though No Doubt didn't appear until 12 years later, but that's beside the point, you know. But uh, yeah, other than that song, though, this is a pretty solid album. If, if you're kind of interested in uh, the lower profile, uh, mostly unknown artists from the 80s, Give Susad and the Next a try. They're, it, it, this is actually pr a pretty darn enjoyable album, I've got to say, as I said probably a couple times already. So, yeah, both albums, actually, this month I, uh, I really enjoyed. So, yeah, it's been uh, possibly a little skimpy of a uh, Spotlight album year so far, but it's been a pretty darn good album uh, year on average for Spotlight albums. And since I'm having a little bit of trouble speaking, it's probably time to wrap up this video, wouldn't you say? Anyway, that'll do it for Backtracks for July of 2020. I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, hit that like button and share it with your friends. And give me your thoughts, questions, suggestions, or constructive criticisms in the comment section below. Also, scroll down to the description for the link to my Twitter and Instagram feeds, and links to my favorite fellow YouTubers who are all worth checking out. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel and browse my past videos, and be sure to ring that notifications bell so you'll be the first to know each time I drop a new video. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching, I'll see you next time, and remember, life's too short to be a music snob.